I am here today with the Kyoto brothers. Uh, you got Char Charles, Charlie, uh, Edward's in the middle, and there's there's Stephen on the, uh, I guess, on your far right watching this. Uh, these gentlemen are respected filmmakers who are, are well known for creating the cult classic Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Uh, additionally, their animation and effects credits include Team America World Police, uh, lots of sequences for The Simpsons, the film Critters, Elf, uh, where I believe is where you guys probably first met John Favreau, but you'll we'll ask you about that. Uh, and Pee Wee's Big Adventure, some classic stop motion animation uh, in that film. Today, we are here to discuss their latest creation, uh, bringing their book, Kyoto Brothers Alien Christmas, to the screen as a stop motion animated movie just in time for the holidays. Guys, uh, I have always, I've loved your work throughout the years. I believe that with this film, you have cemented your legacy in a way beyond maybe anything you've ever been a part of. I think this is an instant classic. So congratulations. Hey, well, seen... Thank you. That, that's so nice to that's hear. That's nice, man. Yeah, that, that's uh, check off one of the boxes. <laughs> I, I mean it. I mean it. I mean, I'm one of these kids who grew up with Rankin Bass Christmas specials and, of course, the work of Art Clokey uh, with Gumby and Pokey and the Davy and Goliath. This touched me. I mean, it just brought that that feeling back for me watching this, those classic oh. movies. But it had a Kyoto Brothers twist, which was which was which was great. It, it, it felt like those. But it it had so much of you guys in it. So I loved it. Um, can you tell me, let's go back to the, the beginning. Um, the book was written, I think, in 2006 or published in 2006. Uh, Stephen, you co-wrote it with Jim Strain. And uh, Charlie, you provided the illustrations. Yeah. Tell me, at the time, did you guys know you wanted to turn this into a, a movie someday? Well, that was the plan. Well, it was, it was, it was funny because like, you hit on it exactly. What, what you loved about it you, is similar to us. It was the, the love of the Rankin and Bass. That was our first some of our first exposure to stop motion animation. I remember down in the basement, we yeah. were making our own little holiday specials down in the basement, but uh, we had like a little devil puppet yeah. we made and we had some elves and we had these little adventures. So we always wanted to duplicate the Rankin and Bass specials. We watched it as a family yeah. and we loved it every year. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, it just, it inspired us and we were planning and, and drawing and animating tests to do a Christmas animated special. Yeah, even even the Remington Shaver, Santa on the Shaver going yeah. through this, the snow in, inspired us. But all this time too, as much as we loved it, we wanted to do something different. You know, tell a, tell a traditional tale of, of Christmas and with Christmas magic, but put a spin on it like we did with Killer Clowns. So we wanted to mash up our classic Christmas special with sci-fi and we came up with Alien yeah, it's funny. and the genesis is really um, we were doing contract work for ABC Family at the time, now Freeform, um, doing interstitials for bumpers for their 25 Days of Christmas campaign. And um, again, it was it was fun because, again, doing what we always wanted to do. Stop motion for Christmas. Christmas. And um, and the executive we were working with, you know, asked us if we had any ideas for a stop motion special. And Stephen was kicking around this idea he had in his head. So uh, we developed a pitch that was essentially Alien Christmas. So we developed all, we developed maquettes, the storyline, you know, presentation artwork, and we we pitched it at the, the but at the time it it didn't take you know it's a it's complicated business. Yeah, stop people motion. people liked the idea, yeah. but we didn't really go. Uh, we didn't get any funding at that point. So we thought well, we've got these assets, we've got these designs, we have these maquettes that we had built. So uh, let's turn it into a a book. Oh, yeah. okay. So it started out really as a film pitch yeah. and then uh, filmed it out. So let's turn it into a book. And then the book became a great film pitch again. Yeah. So, so, so we, had a, we, had a, we had a friend, a mutual friend, Mike Van Eaton, who introduced us to Bob Self from Baby Tattoo Books, um, who was uh, he kind of an eclectic uh, independent book publisher that does really kind of really great art books and things. So, but he was intrigued by the story and fell in love with it and gave, you know, published the book for us. And uh, around the same time is when we were we were working on Elf with John Favreau. Mm. Yeah, and in that in that film, you guys completely put your own twist on Rankin Bass. I mean, that was a recreation of Rankin Bass. Oh, those sequences you guys did. Yeah, yeah. well, it's interesting. John Favreau is a fan of stop motion animation in the same way that we are, 
And uh, he had a vision. He wanted it to look like a Rankin Bass North Pole. Yeah. yeah. He wanted because there's that instant connection. You cannot really separate stop motion from Christmas. It yeah. go, goes hand in hand. So John wanted in order to set up that movie, he wanted to invoke that Rankin and Bass imagery. And uh, you know, we got along really great. And uh, we, you know, he saw that we had the book and he fell in love with the story as well and uh, and tried to help us get something off the ground even back then. Um, but you know, again, even then it was, it was a sl slightly different marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so it didn't happen then, but we'd always kept in contact with one another, remained friendly, and would see each other at conventions and things. And he, well, Alien Christmas was always a topic of conversation. He was always checking, hey, what are you guys doing with that? He was pretty busy. Iron Man 1, Iron Man Yeah, a little busy. A little busy book, building the Marvel Universe. Thing. Yeah, he's I mean, been a little busy. So what was the um so so you've been now connected with uh Favreau for for goodness uh 15 years or more. Uh attached to this project what was the tipping point what was the the moment where it's like okay this is getting made well, how many yeah. places has it been well you know I mean really it was um the streamers you know the fact that there are there are much more avenues for distribution and production and um you know netflix was turned out to be the perfect partner for for this they uh they they saw the passion they loved the the project they saw the creativity and uh they gave us a sufficient budget to pull it off um, what's really great about Netflix is that they really let the creatives run with the project. Um, they're there. They give us general nudges on what they think, you know, observations and things, but um, they let the filmmakers make the film. And uh, so our collaboration with John as our EP uh, was really, really beneficial. It was really kind of the perfect timing. I, I, I thank goodness for Netflix. If it wasn't for Netflix, we'd be lost. I mean, the best content's coming out of that. Uh, company because as you said they do let the creatives do their thing you know it's, it seems to be uh, much more artist friendly so thank you Netflix for yeah. finally no, getting glad. this thing made we're glad that they got it because uh, through the years it was with you know other places it was at one point going to be a feature film and uh, for one reason or another you know the business of Hollywood things come and go uh, people leave you know the people that are your advocates you know, they're no longer working for a studio and all of a sudden you're starting from scratch again through the years. So it was a long, it was 14 years to get this thing done. Yeah, but yeah. it was funny, you know, even though like at one point it had grown to a feature film, um, what John did, he came back and grounded us, pulled us back to the core idea of what the, the storybook was about and the story. So as much as we tried to complicate it, add B and C stories, he kept to no, this is where the heart is, guys. Mm -hmm. And he, he brought us back to that that main through line that is uh, hopefully resonates with the audience. Yeah, the 80 minute version had quite a few uh, A and B stories to it and uh, a lot more characters. Uh, the simplification works for it, for the audience and for the uh, for the season. Well, this is what, uh, thank you for mentioning the heart of it, the emotion of it. Honestly, this is what I think makes this a classic, uh, that heart, the, you know, X's arc, uh, from, you know, a typical thieving klept to a klept with a heart. And Holly, when she first, you know, gets him and he's playing dead and she breathes, you know, grabs him in and hugs him and he turns blue. Oh, my goodness. Like, I, I re that really got to me. And this whole, um, this that runs through this pro project. We see it happen to Z as well with that with that puppy. Sorry, spoilers, guys. You got to watch this movie. Um, okay. But it's the heart, really. And I'm so glad John kept focusing you on that because I think that's one of the strongest elements of this movie. Um, I'd like to get into some of the uh, the 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 details about the pre-production process. Once you got your green light, this is a very ambitious thing to pull off. You had to build sets. You had to build all these characters. You had to build Christmas Town and all the elves in it. What kind of pre-production time did you have to pre-vis your animation, to build your sets, to build all your puppets? Not enough. Yeah, not, <laughs> never enough. No, and they, you know, yeah. as soon as you get the dream is to, you know, to get a, a, a green light, and then you got to realize that you have to produce something. Yeah, and then we, then we, then you waste nine months in business affairs. Yeah, we spent more time <laughs> in business affairs than we did in design work. Yeah, but we, we, we had we had some we had a lot of designs ahead of time, but we hired a really great crew of designers doing character and back and sets and all of that. So we kind of collaborated with a lot of talented people. Yeah, we started writing the script um, late 20, um, 2018 with uh, Keelan O'Rourke uh, was the, the first writer on the project. And 
with him once we got a for the outline and the first draft going we started working with uh mark simon on storyboards and animatics mm -hmm. um so that process um uh, we started pre-production in april of 2019 and we started shooting in june of 2019 it was a pretty accelerated process. And this say, was, that seems was, fast. That seems this was going to air in wow. 2019. It was going to launch in 2019. Yeah, let's let's, let's nail that fact home. <laughs> we were shooting it in April, and it was supposed to be aired on uh, 2019. No. So we were really hauling. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that they uh, they gave us relief on that. So we actually we we finished shooting just uh, right before the Christmas break of 2019. Did our post. Um, of the first half of this year and delivered in August. And we are also reminded how difficult a process stop motion animation is. Everything is built from scratch and animated one frame at a time. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, because there's some fairly, um, you know, tough, complicated sequences in this movie. Uh, Sam 2 down uh, fighting the Klepts, uh the gyrotron that sequence where all his limbs are coming out obviously the whole battle in christmas town there's some really crazy stuff going on um how much were you guys being assisted with cg or, or was this all practical i mean well, it's, all, was, it's, it's all practical everything is practical and that that was a, that was the goal we wanted to make a handmade movie we wanted to invoke rankin and bass um, i mean obviously we take advantage of digital Post, you know, okay. rig removal and compositing, and compositing, and and you know, a lot of multiple passes, which makes something like uh, uh, Sam Two fighting the Klebs possible. Um, yeah. th there, the only CG elements in this movie are the uh, the uh, Klebs spaceships at the very, very, very end. Not and what about the Klebs eyes? Is that all uh, hand animated? Yeah, that's uh, replacement animation. We wanted to uh, make the most expressive eyes because X doesn't talk. All it was is gestures and poses yeah. to communicate, but the eyes were essential. So and they're just replacement little, uh, little eye shapes that have popped in. The, the mouths are post mouths, but okay. that started with artwork. Got they, it. Not, they weren't computer generated mouth shapes. It was drawn artwork that we then rep we did in post. That would, that would have extended the shooting schedule. It would have made it really really, really tedious. So we uh, we put tracking marks on the puppet, then we added those in post. Yeah, our okay. user experience, we're able to, we're able to use the, the modern techniques in combination with the tried and true stuff that we've been doing, you know, for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. But even in that, but even though you were blending things a bit, you were predominantly leaning on the practical approach. And that is the texture in this film is so terrific. And it really does take us back to a better time. Uh, I love I love the texture you captured in this movie. Um, as you know, our community are a bunch of creators and builders. I want to ask a bit more about the construction of the puppets. Um, I'm sure it's different for different puppets, but what was the basic approach? These seem to be uh, sculpted and cast characters. Uh, I'm sure there's some direct fabrication for the bodies underneath the costumes, but what, what can you tell us about the, the approach to creating these puppets? Uh, pretty traditional as far as puppet building. Uh, the heads are hard cast urethane made from sculpts. Interesting, we started out doing traditional sculpting with Siobhan Clay, but we found out the approval stages, it took too long to, to change those, uh, to make those accommodations and changes. So we predominantly did the ZBrush sculpting. The characters were sculpted in ZBrush. We made a master positive through 3D printing. We made molds and we cast all these urethane heads for the characters. Yeah, uh, the hands are silicone, same thing, sculpted in ZBrush, molds, and then cast in silicone. Yeah, Becky Van Cleve was the head of our fabrication, and she had a team of, uh, of incredible artists. Um, and somebody like Noel, uh, the body is, uh, some have uh, traditional ball and socket armatures, but most of these are wire. So there's foam fabrication to create the body shapes, uh, all the wardrobe design and handmade. Mm -hmm. but Nikki Rice was the artist who created most of the, the elf heads. He was a 3D sculptor. And uh, the costumes, uh, Felicia. Felicia Rose, yeah. Felicia Rose did our costumes, which is a you know, beautiful little 
Yeah, that was and, and as you guys uh, actually in your course for Stan Winston School uh, created your armature, uh, it was a wire armature, no no ball and socket armature. Um, the only issue with those wire armatures is is they can break at the joints uh, with you know repeated motion. Did you guys have that situation uh, on on your shoot? And how easy was it to go in there and fix joints and all that? You can't fix the wire once they're broken, pretty much. So how many X's did we make? Oh, you know, like probably 30 or 40, if okay. not more than, probably more than that. Yeah. Uh, they were pretty durable. Uh, they, they did hold up uh, fairly well. Only a few breaks here and there that, that kind of interrupted production, but not very much. So wire does work. Uh, I see these, these puppets are a decent size. Um, tell us your, your decision to go with this scale. Oh, well, that was one of the biggest challenges. That's it. Our main character, X, is the smallest character in the show. And he had to be small enough to be perceived as a doll by our next smallest character. So we reduced him to the minimum we can get away with as far as flexibility and durability of the wire armatures. And it came to about maybe five inches, which made Holly about six or seven inches, which made her mom, ha, uh, uh, Noel, and the dad about eight inches. Then Santa had to be bigger than that. So he's like 10 inches. And then all of a sudden the sets got Really big. Yeah, so we really had to watch the scale. Yeah, we're living probably in like a seventh scale world, mm -hmm. which meant we had to build everything. There was virtually nothing we could buy off the shelf because we <laughs> were, were not in a traditional doll scale. Yeah. So Jeff White and uh, our art director and his team built everything. I think there's one bead in the movie in the beginning in the cleft treasure trove that was bought and then used in the set. Everything else had some sort of either modification or fabrication yeah. associated with it. Yeah, it was out of the question to even consider doing two scales, a separate scale for uh, for X to keep him as small as he wanted. I mean, you had to oversize. Well, so we did do one cheat. Yeah. We have 100% X when he's like working with the robot. And then we had a 90% X when he was being held by Holly. And we uh -huh. said, no, he was just too big to hold like a doll. And so we did cheat and I think it works within the context of the story and people don't really perceive it. We're, we're contemplating, do we shoot X all against green screen and composite him as we need, make him as big as we want him for, for performance purposes. But then that was just, that would be too daunting a task. And you know, we don't feel guilty about it because Willis O'Brien changed the scale of King Kong in the classic 1933. And if Willis O'Brien can do it, the Kyotos can do That's it. What we say. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, you do what you have to do to make the shots work and to tell the story. And I think it uh, probably worked out pretty well. Uh, it, it really did. And uh, it is cool to, to realize that it was X's size that kind of determined how big you had to, that was the key puppet right there. Yeah, it, it um, was. It you knew you couldn't go too small or you couldn't animate him and that determined where you needed to be. And then came the puppy. <laughs> the puppy. <laughs> Which was even smaller. Even smaller. I remember the, the Maya Bridges, uh, Hansel and Gretel. The puppets were this big. Mm -hmm. The sets were enormous, you know, yeah. and the sets, you know, they had to come up through trap doors in the middle of it. So, you know, this is all part of solving the problems in the stop motion world. Yeah, I mean, really the set, the, you know, that was the big concern. We couldn't make the sets too big because then we would, you know, need more, a larger facility, more lights, just the footprint was growing and growing. In fact, actually it was um, too big to do here at our facility. We did all the pre-production. We did all the pre-production building here, both puppets and and art department. But then we actually moved to uh, Bix Picks for actually uh, shooting facilities, where we had uh, 16 stages there, um, and anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 animators <laughs> working at any given time. So you're working on multiple sequences simultaneously. Yeah, it's the yeah. only way to maximize that machine. So, yeah. so at, at our height, we had. 104 people working at at, at one time um, in, in our in actual physical production. We had over 200 different people employed. And then by the time we got through post, it's uh, nearing 300 people. Wow. So guys, I was looking at the credits uh, and it, it's pretty incredible the, the size of the artistic crew you put together, all the puppet builders and sculptors and painters and war, all of it, fabricators. Um, Where'd you find them all? I mean, this is specialized, uh, a specialized craft. W was that hard to assemble a team of that size? Well, 
it, it, interesting because this, we're experiencing a renaissance right now in stop motion. More stop motion is being produced than ever before. And fortunately, there is a talent pool deep enough to do that. But unfortunately, there's so much going on. There's like a, a Leica's doing their production, uh, Guillermo del Toro's doing a production, Henry Selk is doing something stupid, but so many people are, it was hard to get good people, but we were able to, to kind of Yeah, what, what, what's great about because of the Renaissance, more people are trained, there are more opportunities for people to learn the craft of stop motion. Um, our class with you um, has been training people. So um, now the talent pool is larger than ever before. Um, you know, and we went through a, a lot of people based on what was going on, but um, worked uh, really amazing. Uh, the, the model makers, uh, extraordinary uh, people, uh, the, the food on the, in the banquet table, just it's, it's extraordinary work. I'm blown away by it. Oh, and the animators, you know, I thought it was like a dwindling crew of people as we got older, but there's a new crop of animators that are just extraordinary. I wasn't familiar with some of them. We gave them a shot and I was overwhelmed with the performances they were able to provide. Well, and what do you guys attribute this renaissance to, this, this huge explosion of new stop anim animation artists and projects? I, I think stop motion speaks to what really brings most artists to any craft. They like to physically hold objects. They like to paint, they like to sculpt, they like to sew. And that tangible quality is really what stop motion is all about. Yeah, I think, and I think there's a burnout on CG to some degree. Yeah, it's it's using everything from commercials to you know music videos to feature films, television shows. It's so prevalent in our visual medium right now, and not everybody can afford you know top of the line ILM or WIDA digital animation. So there's some really bad stuff. So when they see stop motion or something a real object on a real set, I think people react to it differently. And in multimedia, people are different seeing stories told in different ways now. So uh, I think it's people want to play around with it. Well, you know, what's scary is that the quality of stop motion is approaching CG. Of course, the thousands of different levels and details that are capable in CG, you can have little tweaks and little things. You can have hair changes and stuff digitally and stuff. So aside from that, but stop motion, the hands-on animation and manipulation frame by frame you have to tell people now that it's stop motion because they can't tell the difference between that and digitally animated. Yeah, some of the Leica features, it's it's just so beautiful and pristine. It's refined so well, it hardly distinguishes itself from CG. Well, what, advancements cool the, what, what advancements in the art of stop motion do you think have have helped it get to that level of finesse? What's changed in the last you know, the single, years? The single software. largest thing is uh, Dragon Frame, Jamie Cleary's Dragon Frame digital capture software. It enables you to do like an onion skinning type <clears throat> reference while you're animating that smooths it out like never before. Mm -hmm. So you've got this lyrical, almost 2D quality of animation that really does uh, uh, accentuate any performance. Yeah, so you know, using digital technology, the DSLR cameras, um, digital capture, it, with Dragon Frame, you could see the a show a shot progressing as you do it. If you make a mistake, you can go back and match it, and then uh, once you're done, you can review it immediately and approve it and move on. Yeah, unlike the good old days where you had to do a 15-hour shot and hope that everything went okay, that a light didn't go out or something <laughs> like that. I had to wait till the next day to see it when you got the yeah, dailies. Camera. Only had the director say, oh, we have to reshoot this thing. Yeah, hope the <laughs> camera didn't jam or hope the camera system actually loaded it. The good old days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but but I think people are attracted to stop motion when you actually see the physicality, the textures that are duplicated in the, with the technique. It's, it's literally magic. You're seeing these inanimate objects come alive and emoting and affecting you as an audience. And that's magic. Yep. So let's get let's dive into a couple specifics uh, about character and sequence. First of all, which character do you feel was the most uh, challenging to bring to life for this uh, for this show? Oh, they're all challenging in their own way. It's, it's really hard to say to me. Uh, X is our lead and our most sophisticated character. Just a quick backstory. We had originally written the script with a contentious relationship between X and Sam too. They both spoke and they were constantly bickering with this power, uh, like a power grab between the two. And we talked it over with John and he understood what we were trying to do, but he said, guys, why don't you try 
I was thinking of Laurel and Hardy, a tit for tat type relationship. But John said, yeah, but what about like somebody like Buster Keaton? You know, the every man against the world. He said, that's something that we could really grab onto. And I, I started to get it. I said, yeah. Then he said, let's not make X talk. Let's not make Sam two talk. So I'm freaking out here thinking, how are we gonna do this? But when we talked about it further, he was right. So we took on the challenge, we bit the bullet and did it. And I'm really glad we did because I think the nonverbal actions of the guys made the pantomime and the, the movement and the timing of the animation is what's dominant now in the performance, not talking heads. So it was a brilliant move on John, great suggestion. He's a great collaborator and uh, he was right. And I think he made a, a stronger film. And that's, that's what the changed, that, that, that changed the uh, animation, the rehearsals now, the, the notes to the animator now is, you know, we're not worried about dialogue here, but he has to emote now 300%. Yeah, the pose to pose expression of the character is what helps them emote. And then that's where the animator as actor, performer comes through. They, they have to embody that that being that and bring it out and bring it to life through the puppet. And that, that's well, what the real talent is. But this guy here, Santa was a big challenge unto himself. <clears throat> now Santa's the ultimate optimist, happy and jolly all the time, nothing ever gets him down. And he uh, gives Obi this horrible challenge to build a super sleigh. He's like, Santa says, okay, Obi, build it. And Obi says, yeah, right, Santa, thanks a lot. So Santa was a really interesting character, very hands-on. He likes to grab and hold people. Uh, Savannah Steiner really helped bring him to life. She did most of the Santa Claus sequences and she really epitomized his kind of, kind of burly, hands-on type boss who, uh, <laughs> who gets, gets things done at everybody else's expense. He's a really unique Santa Claus. Exactly. Have it done by tomorrow. I know you will, Obi. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that uh, Santa's narration helped you out a lot with the sequences with X and Sam too, because you did at least have Santa talking us through it a little bit, right? So that yes. was there's there's a lot of story beats that weren't told through dialogue, so he used I guess a traditional trope of having a storyteller tell the story, and he was our narrator, the perfect narrator. Yeah, it, it worked. It, the, uh, the simplicity of it. Um, it wasn't confused by dialogue. Uh, the story kept simple and the beats were maintained. And I think that's the strong point. Uh, Sam 2 was a real challenge as well. Just the, That's the, the one I was going to say when I was going, I was like, I think Sam 2 must have been the toughest because of the amount of stuff that flies out of him. And some exactly, of the yeah, exactly that. That's it. Kim Blanchett was the key animator on, on Sam 2. And uh, he took on the challenge of, just the whole thing comes apart. There's so many replacement mm -hmm. animation features that that burst out of this guy. And he gave it character. He makes Sam 2 come alive. The little pops and quirks like that gives him some, some really fun character. And oh, then yeah. we have Z. Uh, Ian Boone was pretty much the, the, the animator for him, but for her. And uh, she's the, the ultimate supreme evil leader. Yeah, we tried to set up the, you know, polar opposites, <laughs> uh, you know, ultimate evil, you know, leads through intimidation and fear. Santa Claus, the eternal optimist, leads through love and caring and, and encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to shout out to the actors, though. Barbara Goodson is Z. She did a beautiful job. Uh, Santa voiced by, is it pronounced Keith Farley? Keith, Keith Farley, yeah. Uh, Keith Farley, X D. Bradley Baker. Um, Holly was K K Kayla Rambo. Um, I didn't, Obi's uh, actor's name is not an IMDb yet. Who voiced Obi? A special guest star came in and did Obi. Ooh. It's a special Easter egg. Figure is it out. It John Favreau? We don't know. I think it sounded like him, but I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll have to do a little detective work on that. Yeah. All right. We have a, a few more questions here, guys, and then we'll, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so that was my question about just tough characters to animate. Let's talk about the most challenging sequence. Wait, what sequence just broke your backs? Uh, and are you perhaps most of pr most proud of how you pulled it off? Oh, was the uh, battle sequences. So the battle sequences are all like little vignettes. So they were a little easier. I would say the, uh, the, the battle in the kennel. We have the, end, uh, the gyrotron gets activated. Earth loses its gravity. Everybody's floating. And then we have... Uh, Noel, Holly, and Obi trying to save the puppies in the kennel. And they're all floating around and they're trying to get the job done. Um, again, Ian Boone animated that. And uh, to keep those characters floating around and get the action going was, was a bit challenging. Yeah, that, that was a motion challenge to be able to 
uh, sell the weightlessness. Mm -hmm. There's one shot in that sequence where the snowman is is actually floating and starting yeah. to come apart. I mean, there's so many great moments when it when they happen. Yeah, it could happen. Yeah, and the clips, the clips were just a, a, a blast. It was a Johnny Mc, uh, McCann who animated that, and uh, just all those characters having all of those characters in the room uh, was 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 a challenge. Uh, and then the gyrotron, uh, the, the battle with X and Sam two. There's so many moments, but then it was the really tender moments that were really challenging in a different way. We had e, uh, e. Joe Lee and Tucker Barry did some beautiful, very sensitive work with Holly and X with the puppy when mm -hmm. she catches him stealing in their living room. Um, very sensitive, very gentle, expressive animation. Two brilliant, brilliant animators. I love that scene so much. He's he's leaving and she understands and she's used to her dad leaving so often to go work for Santa and she teaches him the power of love. What a great scene that was. Um, I'm getting all verklempt even thinking about it, you guys. <laughs> oh, I'm glad it affected you that way because that's what we were trying to do. It and, did. And we were trying to bring this kind of uh, 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 holiday warmth about the, the magic of giving, the love that's involved in exchanging a gift with somebody. Yeah, and then still insert that little bit of Kyoto Brothers, I don't want to say snarky humor, but again, I just have a little fun with the genre too. Now again, not because we want to make fun of it, because we love it. And just, yeah, have, have that fun. Know that we're what we're, we're honoring. Like the reindeers, you know? <laughs> Santa had yes. this idea for the super sleigh, but then somebody's out of a job. <laughs> yeah, great. Love it. And they, I noticed they have a New York accent. It's like, yeah, it's what we do after you say this. <laughs> that, um, that, that, was, that, was a, that was a good line. So the, the moment I knew I was watching a Kyoto Brothers production is right in the opening there when Santa has, has got all the elves gathered and he's telling the story. He goes, it, it was really weird. And then it the Kyoto, that, that wonderful music kicks in. Uh, that was, I guess, composed by Adam Schiff. Adam and Schiff. we go into the into that uh, ornament on the tree and we know we're in the Kyoto Brothers version of a classic Christmas tale. You, you know, that music really kicked in and you knew, you knew. So I wanted to ask you about that music because it does feel very Kyoto Brothers. What's the relationship with Adam Schiff and what was your, uh, I guess, your um, your marching orders for him? for the feeling you wanted to capture? Well, we were very fortunate. We had an opportunity to work with Hans Zimmer's company, uh, Bleeding Fingers. Mm. And uh, and yeah. Adam's a uh, composer in residence there. First time we were working with him. Um, and it was it's just really great. You know, uh, I mean, in terms of like marching orders, it was... Well, actually, what, yeah. we, what we tried to do with the imagery, imagery, we tried to have a contrast between the dull gray colorless world of the clips and the vibrant festive colors of Christmas Town. So that's what we did visually in the in the show. We wanted to create the same kind of feeling with the music. So we wanted to kind of tap into the 60s sci-fi theremin sounds, that kind of stuff that you just know is sci-fi. But then when we get to Christmas, we wanted to have, again, all the, the bells and the glockenspiels the and the, hint the choir. Yeah, and the choir to give us that Christmas magic. And then when we have the battle, we wanted to mash it up musically that you hear both of these two things battling. And uh, I think Adam did a great job, very creative, and the sounds he was kind of mining for, the clips, the contrast, the wonderful lush sounds of Christmas, I was just so happy. The out-of-tune piano uh, for the clips. Well, the clip theme, X's clip theme, is an out-of-tune piano <laughs> that he purposely kind of screwed up to make it sound out of this world. Yeah, musical themes of giving versus taking. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, the music was perfect and it felt so much like a Kyoto Brothers uh, show. I think that music really helped. Um, Char Charles, Charlie, I got a question for you. You illustrated the original book. Uh, you are, you know, the primary uh, visual artist uh, of the Kyoto Brothers in that way. You're the sketcher, the illustrator. Um, you had a whole team coming on in this case, expanding your world that you that you illustrated originally. Um how was it for you to see other artists take on uh, those duties and expand upon your vision? You know, you know, through the the you know the, the the decades of working with the brothers, you know, they come to us and we design it and and it and it works out. We've done always kept it in house, working with other artists, of course. Um, in this case, it was such a 
a, a huge undertaking. Um, the, uh, the basic look was determined by the book. We had to pull back a little bit. Um, and I was, I was intimidated at first. And then I realized that I'm surrounded by the most talented young people in the industry. And I said, what the hell am I worried about? Uh, about? I'm, I, so I sat back and I said, you know what? I'm gonna let these people, instead of micromanaging and, and doing stuff, um, Stephen was loving the stuff that was being done. John was loving stuff. Netflix had input, they wanted the, their stuff. So basically where it would just be me drawing stuff and you know, and, and building it, it was a team of really creative people. And I'm looking at the stuff and saying, well, I have nothing to worry about here. Yeah. And, and it was a pleasure. That's funny. And then uh, Netflix, uh, you know, James Baxter, who's a resident at Netflix, paid us a visit one day to kind of go through all the characters and yeah, kind fun. of give us the input and blessings. So that was great. But actually what they did do, Netflix made a really interesting call. Um, they wanted, they brought in a, a diversity expert to kind of guide us into diversifying right. our, our cast, something that unfortunately I wouldn't have considered. Now, I'm really glad they did. So our L's are now uh, uh, the color palette, the ethnicity of our cast is, is really diverse. And I'm glad they did because in today's world, this film would look like it was made in the 60s if we did not have a variety of ethnicities within our cast. So that was Netflix's um, kind of contribution to our whole design aesthetic. And how many countries is this going to be seen in? All of them. <laughs> Every one, even ones that don't have Christmas. I mean, I loved I loved the fact, I was gonna say, there were certain things that hearkened to Rankin Bass and certain things that you knew made it a film of today. And that inter, the, the, the ethnicity, the interracial couple at the heart of the story, Obi and Noel and their, their mixed daughter, Holly, I mean, how great was that? I loved that. Thank you, Netflix. That was a really good. Yeah, that, yeah, that was great. We agree. It's, yeah, uh, it, just, it just makes it, it feels very comfortable. Oh, it feels real now. It feels contemporary. Uh, we're just so happy. You know what? I've, I look back at some of the older stuff from the 60s and 70s, and I'm going, there's only white people here. There's only yeah. white cast. And I'm, I, I'm actually aware of it you know, that uh, it was all just, uh, it was homogenized. Yeah, basically. how exclusionary it was. Yeah. I mean, it just, it, it, it was a revelation, really was. Well, I really think that was a great idea on Netflix's part and that you guys ran with it as one of the special elements of this, this movie. A couple more questions and we're wrapping up, guys. Um, now that you've finished this film and by the time people are seeing this interview and reading this article, it's out there for the world to see. How do you guys feel about the final result uh, in comparison to what you hoped it would be? Uh, well, actually for me, I'm a little too close to it. Uh, I still see elements of critiquing and making it. So I haven't watched it for two months now. I'm just trying to stay away from it so that I could possibly enjoy it as an audience member. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny right now, we've done our job, we've done the best we could give whatever circumstances we were, were under. Now, our ownership is we have to release it to the world. Now it's for the people to decide whether it's any good or not. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely loved it. I have seen it twice. And I think you have an instant classic on your hands and you're known for a lot of great things. I think this is the thing that you will maybe be known for more than anything else. It's that good. I, I really, I think you oh. got a classic here. I think this is gonna be every year, appointment viewing, you gotta watch Alien Christmas. I think that's what's gonna happen. I mean, that's um, that's our biggest goal. I mean, what we uh, what we grew up with, you know, when Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was on, Santa Claus is coming to town. Um, at Grinch. that time, there were only three networks. You yeah, had, yeah, you had yeah. one television, the family got together to watch it. Even growing up, when we had it on DVD or tape, my family would, gather around when it was on the network television because that sense of community uh watching it together we're hoping that's what this becomes that it is an, an event thing where families going to want to watch it together i have no doubt i have no doubt uh 
Guys, you've already, I was going to ask you what you think the future of stop motion is, but we've already discussed that. It seems to be brighter than it's been in a long time. And that's great. I, I couldn't be happier. And I know our community feels the same. So I'll ask the final question. Um, now that you guys have achieved this, and this is the, the classic Hollywood question, just when you've climbed the mountain, you've done something great, they ask you, so what's next? <laughs> so what I know you guys are always hatching ideas. I know you guys are always thinking about uh, ways to be creative. Where are your creative juices flowing these days? Wow. Well, there was talk about Alien Halloween. Ooh. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> but we have, we still have ideas that, that have been percolating for years. And you would seem to think, well, let's forget about it. That's an old idea. But it takes so long to get any good idea off the ground and produced, funded, and on the air. Uh, so, yeah, we go back to our, our uh, archives and start to resurrect some of our Yeah, there, there, are, a couple, there are a couple of things, a couple of uh, passion projects that we still have, uh, hopefully, going to get, get made. No, we, got, we have ideas, and there are a lot of people, a lot of, if you look at the, the, the stuff that's being done, amazingly creative stuff, but nobody else gives it the Kyoto Brothers spin. I don't know what that is exactly, but people seem to like it, and that's good. <laughs> well, it's an exciting time for filmmakers, creators in general. This is a, it feels a lot like the uh, the the video boom in uh, the eighties, um, with all the streamers uh, coming out there. There's a, such a desire for product, and it's just and it's not schlock product. There's some really great Quality things stuff. being done, oh, so yeah. it's really exciting um, with all the technology advances and things. It's, it's a great time to be. Uh, be a creator. And I well, like black stuff too. Well, that's a perfect way to wrap this up. It is a, a great time to be a creator. And we're so glad that you guys are still creating after all these years and are really at the top of your game. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful movie you created uh, with that army of folks uh, that surrounded you. Thank goodness John Favreau uh, kept his belief in the project and helped you guys usher it through. Netflix did a wonderful job. And I, I honestly have said it a few times in this interview, I think you have a, a classic on your hands here. Uh, so thank you for chatting with me today and our entire community. Uh, once again, guys, we were joined by the Kyoto Brothers. Charles, Edward, Stephen, please all of you, if you haven't seen it yet, make an appointment to yourself and your family to watch the Kyoto Brothers Alien Christmas on Netflix. You will love it. Thanks again, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Matt. Matt.